Okay, so this chapter uh, is um, it's about um, a lot of it's about some of the kind of low level functions that you wouldn't normally use when developing Shiny, which are used to um, to kind of underpin things like the um, reactive event and observe event functions that you would use as a, you know, to respond to button clicks and things like that. Um, and also there's quite a bit of uh, content on um, different types of reactive value and 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 kind of and the different types of observers and things. It's, so it's quite a it's quite a meaty chapter, really. Um, uh, yes. So the chapter um, I is intended to kind of introduce you to the reactive values and expressions. Well, expand on what was talked about in the earlier book chapters uh, to talk about observers, which are more kind of um, they are. Oh, I'll come. I'll come to them. They're, they're they're similar to outputs in that they're like part of the reactive graph that um, are eagerly uh, evaluated. Um, so they're used for things like writing to files and and whatnot. Um, how these three things uh, are built from the lower level functions and how things like error messages and and um, and what not work within Shiny. Um, there's a few tools used um, that, sorry, a couple of these we used last week as well, but I've kind of the first time I've used them uh, for real. Um, so I've put them in here. Um, so the Reactive Console will, I'll probably be using to run um, server type code in our studio in in the console that is and react log as well um so is that it no there's a bit more prerequisite stuff so the important thing um that diamantis was talking about last week uh regarding reactives is that they are both lazy and cached so these are values well, i mean Obviously, they're, they're things where their their value you can view it as as kind of changing with time, but as the value changes, it only does it when it's completely necessary, and when it does it, it saves the value that it's computed. Um, the observers that we're going to be talking about later uh, are kind of opposite to this. They're eagerly evaluated and um, have no memory. Um, there's a couple of other things that are more R level stuff that aren't um, explicitly shiny things that, that, that might be good to know a little bit about in, in this chapter. Um, the reference semantics, so I've, I've got some examples of how that works, but typically in R, um, data structures have a copy on modify semantics, which means that um, um, if you pass a value into a function and it modifies that object, the original copy of that object that you passed into the function isn't, it isn't seen to be modified from the outside of that function. Um, I, I'll give you some kind of example code that explains that a little bit more. Um, and there's a function on exit that, that's also talked about. So it, it's useful to know something about the kind of functions that are only ever used inside other functions to, to, to understand this chapter. Um, there are a couple of examples used earlier on in the book, which the, the chapter comes back to as well, and we'll get to them in time. Um, okay, so let's move on. Reactive values. 
these are um, objects that um, you can initialize them with a specific value. And as time progresses, you can update that value. Um, so for example, you could, uh, the, the difference between the two, reactive val and reactive values, is this is more like holding a single value. Whereas this is like holding um, multiple different values. So you'd initialize a reactive val with a single value like this, whereas you'd initialize a reactive values object um, with potentially multiple um, elements defined within it. To get values back out of there, you'd use this um, kind of function call type syntax for getting values out of a reactive val. And you use this kind of list subsetting type syntax to get stuff out of a reactive values. Now, in the, in the book, Hadley mentions that he doesn't particularly like to use this syntax in um, kind of training materials for Shiny because it, because it isn't obvious that something weird's going on in the background. So what's actually happening here, x dollar a, is that you're pulling out or potentially evaluating a, um, a value that's stored within a reactive values object there. Um, and it looks a bit more clean that something weird's going on with the reactive val syntax. So um, anyway, both of these objects, both of these classes of objects have uh, reference semantics. So what does that mean? That means um, in R, typically, if you've got a function here and you pass in a list, and then that function, what it does is modifies one of the elements in that list to have a different value and then returns the list. What you'll get on passing a list into that function, the value that's returned from it will be a different object from the one that you originally passed in. Um, I don't know whether that makes sense. So the value that's returned would have this A element set to two whereas the value that you passed in would be unmodified. It would still have this value of A set to one. There's another way of showing um, this um, copy on modify semantics. So if you've got two different objects that are initialized with the same value, and then you set one of them to a different value, the um, other, so if you've got x1 and x2 both set to hold this value, um, and then you change x2 to hold the value two, x1 won't be modified, um, but x2 will be. Um, now that's quite different in reference semantics. I'll show you that bit first. So if I define a class, this is an R6 class, which is a bit advanced really, I guess. Um, but the reference class behavior is quite common in, in the, the underlying code for Shiny. So I've defined a class here that holds two values. And I can create an object of that class using this syntax here. Um, so if we look at the elements that are stored in y at the moment there's this value a that hold sorry the element the a element holds a value one and the b element holds a value of two um if i then um pass that through a function that modifies one of those elements um then the object y is modified um and similarly, if I make two separate objects and set one of the values to a different, you know, um, then both copies of 
that object get modified. This is, I, I don't know whether that makes sense, but this is something that's quite common in um, Shiny. Um, so there's an exercise in the book um, that uh, illustrates how to get and set values from a reactive, sorry, from a reactive values, the, the list type version. Um, and I've included a kind of solution to that as well. Um, but I think I summarized the, the, the syntax for doing that at the start of this. Um, and there's another exercise that is used to kind of illustrate that these reactive values have reference semantics. So um, if we start with one reactive val and make a clone of that, so there's now there's two objects with the same. Um, so that's a reactive value that's pointed to by two separate objects. There, no, I mean, always use the wrong words when I discuss this kind of thing. Anyway, so I've got a reactive value and I've got, I've copied it into another variable as well. I've got a second uh, reactive value that's held by a completely different object. Um, and then hold on, I'll run this in here. Then if I do this, right, we can see that the hell x and y are held at the same position in memory. Uh, whereas z is held at different position in memory. So they're different objects. X and y are, are the same object effectively, and z is a different object. Um, if I then run this. They all have the value one at the moment. If I set x to be two, then x and y should both be modified. So if you look there, x has the value two and y has the value two. But Z still has the value one. Um, and after all that kind of modification and things like that. Um, the address of that X uh, variable is still the same. So that's another one of the exercises in the thing. It basically all it does is show that rea reactive values have this reference semantics, which is why you're able to update val this reference thing kind of underlines underlies how within shiny you can update values as time progresses if you were kind of relying on ours um copy on modify things i think it would probably be a lot harder to implement shiny um anyway we'll move on from that um reactive expressions there was an example of this in section in the chapter on user uh, feedback um so this what happens here that um you so the underlying thing there was you were trying to um read in a, a data set and um on uh and while reading it in you show a notification to the user that you're reading in the data. And then there's this function on exit, um, which takes away that notification. So the notification shows up as that reactive starts to run. Then the um, data sets read in. And then when you've come out of this reactive expression, the notifications removed. So this function on exit is kind of 
it's used to tell typically it's used uh, within a you know if this was a, a kind of function definition a more kind of typical function definition on exit would be used to say when this function has finished running run this bit of code um, um so why right so so this is an um what am i doing here all right can i just have a look at the book here um reactive expressions errors okay so Right, so so all I was pulling that out was a, an example of a reactive expression. Um, so had in the in the book, they explain that these um, the, the, basically that they've talked about reactive expressions quite a lot, so they kind of rush through this thing. Um, but he's keen to explain how errors. Um, propagate around the reactive graph. Um, so if we take this here, so this is um, a reactive expression and all it does is throw an error. Now, um, what does that mean in, 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 normal, in a normal setting when you're running R and a function throws a stop it throws an error using stop, the evaluation of that function will stop and you'll either be returned to the console if you're running interactively or the script that you're running will crash. Um, when you're now crashing is probably a bit dangerous in Shiny because if you crash without warning the user why you've crashed, they're not going to be very happy um, because they've no way of working out what caused your app to crash. So what happens to this kind of value, this kind of error message in Shiny? So, right. When we evaluate that reactive expression, we get an error. Well, we um, an error message shows up. Um, then, well, we don't really need to s sleep the system now. Um, but if I evaluate it again, um, the error itself is cached. So it's not just the it's not just kind of um, a, a kind of typical value that's cached by Shiny in when it evaluates a reactive expression. Also, things like um, um, error messages can be cached by the reactive values as well. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, so it was, there's another exercise in the book where we want to show how errors propagate throughout the graph. Now, did I say something here? Um, yeah, uh, in the book, it says that there's, there's different behavior uh, depending on the, um, the uh, depending on what the, the reactive graph looks like. So if there's, when, when these errors reach an output, um, node which is the kind of thing that would you know render text type um thing um the error would be displayed by the app if it's an observer which is uh something that you'd call for a side effect so a thing that might log to the console or something that might write to a file or something like that um by default if that catches a stop error message, it will crash the, crash the session unless you wrap it in a kind of error handling code. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is show the app that results from this. Right, hold on. I might have to. Okay, so um, so what what's this app do? So if when the user clicks on this error button here, an error is um, initiated by this reactive expression, and that reactive express the you know the evaluated version of that reactive expression is used in this, and then that's used in this. So the um, the values should propagate along the graph. Now, what was the code to, it was F3, control F3, yeah. Right, so this is React log. If I find it very hard to view, to be honest. Right, so input error, there's no error to begin with. Then that value is fine, that's fine, fine. So if we now click this, an error has been caught and the output node, uh, so the error has propagated all the way from here where it was initialized through um, the B node and then the C node to this output node. And now it's being shown to the user. So that's an error value propagating through the graph in the same way that a typical R value would propagate. Um, 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 uh, I don't know whether it's worth me going back and eval. Can I? see i think i'll zoom on from this um but basically it's just a kind of way of showing that error values are being used in the same way that normal values are used in the um shiny uh reactive graph um okay let's go on on exit um so on exit uh, is used to um, run some code after a function body is completed, or like I was saying earlier on. So, um, so how does that work with a reactive expression? Because with a, with a reactive expression, it's simply a, a, a block of code. It's not necessarily it, it doesn't actually look the same as a uh, function definition and function body in, in R. Um, but what actually happens um, 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 it's all the rest of the code as well. Right, so um, hold on, sorry, I've got a bit lost here. Right, yeah, so this was the ex the kind of motivating example for this bit of my notes. Um, when this code block completes, this code is run by Shiny to remove the notification that's initially shown to the user. Um, And the reason that works in Shiny is because this kind of reactive expression type code here, if you chase the code through the Shiny code base, is actually doing something more akin to this. So that is defining a function that runs this. And within that, uh, so any on exit 
code that you might put inside a reactive expression here would actually be evaluated from within a function body. Um, so if you actually look at the source code for reactive, um, the reactive expression you get that you pass in is actually converted into a function, um, which is subsequent eva subsequently evaluated. Um, so yeah, so it's not surprising that on exit should work. Uh, right. So oh, what's happened here? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, just a second. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, if anyone's got any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me during the thing. Um, uh, I've lost me <laughs> book notes, though. <laughs> right. Okay. So observers. Um, we used to draw a reactive uh, graph. Um, observers and outputs would be the things at the very right hand side. These are the things that have no um, dependence. So um, for outputs, that's pretty obvious. So it, outputs are the things that, um, you know, uh, compute the text or the graphs or something like that, that are then passed to the UI function. Um, observers are a little more subtle as to what they actually do. Um, but like I've been saying throughout, the, the observer um, things are typically used for their side effect alone. Now, there's a lot of code on the internet you can find where people are using observe event or event observe or whatever it's called. Um, so they're using observer nodes but they're within the code for that. They're saving reactive values and, and things. It's uh, uh, anyway. Um, I think there's a discussion of that next week. Um, but typically, you're supposed to use these just for side effects. Now, there's some code in one of the exercises later that looks like this, um, or maybe it was from last week. Um, so, if you've got a server function that has a reactive expression that's the only thing that's present in the server that reactive expression will never run because the because reactive expressions are lazy they'll only run if there's something forcing them to run now if your output function if your output um expressions were similarly lazy nothing would ever get done. So if in here you had a output dollar value equals x, um, if that was lazy, not, nothing would get done by this server at all. But the output um, nodes are eager rather than lazy. So if they can evaluate, they will, and they'll do it as soon as possible. Um, so in that way, these observers and outputs are different from reactives, but also they forget the value that they uh, compute. For observers, that's pretty obvious because they don't return a value, but for outputs, um, they just compute a value, pass it back to the UI and, and then forget about it. Um, so, but the eagerness of these things is infectious. So if you've got an output um, that's structured like this, anything that it depends upon to compute output dollar $x would become, would be evaluated if output dollar $x hadn't been evaluated yet. It would, its eagerness, sorry, the eagerness of output dollar $x would permeated to any of its dependencies. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so 
there's a lower level function called observe, which is used to um, define both the observers that you'd make with observe event and the output values that you'd construct in the same way. Um, this, um, this function, it's quite interesting. Uh, so if you, hold on, I'll, I'll copy this over as well. Um, what was it again? React log enable. Right, let's just do this to begin with. So if we start with a reactive value, then we run y5. Oh, what's going on? Something's, something's amiss here. Hmm. Russ, did you turn on your reactive console? I believe so. I, th I think React Log only shows the graph when you run it. Oh, out. God, yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm using the wrong thing. Yes, of course, yes. I saved all the tools I needed to run this. And then you and then you forgot. Uh, yes, true. Right. Sorry, sorry, my fault. Um, right, so, yeah, I was trying to work out why the observe didn't run immediately because it's supposed to. So yeah, that's eagerly evaluated. It tells you that the message is such and such. It's fascinating. If, it's so eager that it, it, it why is five evaluated twice when as soon as you turn the reactive console on? Like that observer was there <laughs> waiting for someone to give her permission. <laughs> Finally show a thing. Is that what happened? <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't even notice that. But yes, that's quite interesting. So um, 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 why five? Yes. Uh, so, um, though here we haven't actually, we haven't told that message to write out, but it knows that it ought to. So it kind of eagerly runs. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hadn't, I hadn't realized that. Uh, that's brilliant. Okay. Um, so, um, an, an interesting thing that, that, that came out of this when, when I was reading the chapter was, um, was this example. I found it quite, com qu quite confusing to begin with. Um, but I probably wasn't thinking about it the right way around. So um, observe itself, you shouldn't think of it as doing something more that it creates something. So what it's actually doing in this code is whenever y is, so y is defined here, and this observe um, expression, is actually creating a, a node in a you know a, a, a reactive graph somewhere that knows that when x is evaluated it should run in the code here every time this expression runs a new observer node is created um, which will print the value of x so what um, happens here i don't know whether i have to clear all those will that work i'm a bit confused we maybe it'll become clear once you show it but why you have an observe within an observe you can't why wouldn't you just do print inside of the outside observe. oh i did um sorry i did make a, a version of it where um where the code did look like that but what what's actually happening it's not quite the same as that um so each time each time this is re-evaluated an extra node is created that looks at x so it's not if you just had print x without that nested observe call mm -hmm. you would only ever get one 
um, thing printed out at a time. Hold on, I did. Um, oh, I didn't put it into this book, but uh, hold on, where's my yes code notes? Uh, yes, so it. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, it's slightly different, the, the example that I use. So, um, yeah, so I was wondering whether that X was actually required. And it turns out that, that it actually is. But um, I have a cleaner way of seeing the same thing. Um, now, sorry, um, yeah, you, you wouldn't normally nest an observe inside another observe. And, and, and in the book, it's quite, um, it, it does recommend that you don't ever do that. Um, but what this shows is that, um, hold on, I don't know whether it, whether it would be worth doing this using React's log, because if you, if you did that, I don't know how I'd configure the server function, to be honest, but um, you'd be able to see new nodes depending on X being added to the graph as you um, recompute Y. Oh. Uh, I don't know whether that's... Sorry, if I understand correctly, if you go back to your console there where you have X, X um, of two and ran, yeah. ran it three or four more times, it would just like, it would print out two, three times and then four times and then five times. It would always- uh -huh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. there's like, like multiple mini little baby observers inside observing their parents. Constantly yeah, yeah, yeah. spawned every time. Oh, I don't. Okay, I think I get it, but I'm, I'm just like How, conceptualizing. Why, you, why would I ever do that? I don't think you would. I think that this is like I, I remember Hadley's advanced art programming was somewhat like this. There was a lot of like toy examples doing completely insane things that are just kind of great for teaching or something. Okay. Don't make his point, but like no one would ever do this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a kind of. Um, it's a, a slight modification of the same thing. So if I change um, G now, hold on, is G, yeah, no, sorry, it already started as two. Um, at present, H has been evaluated and this observer node has been added to the graph. And every time G is updated, that node will print the value of G. So if I do that a few more times, it will only print once. But if I now modify F, then this whole observer will reevaluate and a new thing, a new node will be added to the graph that watches G. So if I now do um, F of two, um, and then of one, we've added an extra observer of G. So yeah, it's just a toy example, but it kind of explain, it, it helps to understand that an observe function creates something which is subsequently used rather than, um, um doing something explicitly um I, I don't know whether that helps though <laughs> um i might only have time to talk about isolation and and leave the timed invalidation section of the book which is probably for the best really because i don't think i actually wrote many notes in the timed invalidation thing. um okay so these are two functions that you would use uh quite frequently in when you know when writing a, a a shiny app a lot of the other things observe and 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 a function later on in this section called isolate are kind of internal shiny things that help um make these functions possible um so these two i think there was an ex yeah sorry there was an example in the very first chapter on reactivity um, where 
um, 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 what's in the server function yes so um so the ui you input two different rate values and a um a number of values to sample from a poisson distribution um and it was kind of put together in a way that made the sampling of the um, values, the only reactive dependency for that is when the user clicks this button. So there's no reactive dependency for this node here on these values that are defined within the reactive expression. Um, within, sorry, within that expression. It only depends upon the user clicking that simulate button. Um, and how that actually works is quite, quite difficult to explain given our current understanding of Shiny and how it works. So that there's an expression, these nodes are used, surely there should be a reactive dependency. And, and it's this function um, isolate that allows you to separate the uh, nodes upon which you depend, the nodes upon which you create a reactive dependency from the nodes that you use when computing the value that results from a reactive expression. Um, but yeah, uh, th this this example is in section three five two. There's another uh, example in three five one that uses a kind of timed invalidation thing where these values are resampled every half a second or something. Um, so um, so what's going on there? There's a function event reactive that makes a new reactive a new reactive expression that has a reactive dependency on this kind of first set of nodes um, and where it evaluates a function that might depend on other reactive values or reactive expressions but doesn't take an actual explicit reactive dependency on them and the way it does that is using isolate um da, da, da. so the but yeah i mean all that's doing though is shifting the understanding is so i didn't understand event reactive but now i don't understand how isolate works and what it does if you look at the um the help page for for isolate is it takes this expression here and steps into a scope where it can evaluate those that expression and the nodes that are mentioned within it without um the graph being updated to 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 state that there's a dependency of this reactive on the on that um which is quite I mean, it's quite neat, but I still don't quite understand the uh, innards of it. But um, but yeah, it looks like it might step into a different environment and evaluate something and then come back into um, the original environment. Um, so, um, so there's, yeah, there's a counting example in the book, which kind of illustrates how this, how this works. So, um, if you had an observer where, so what are you doing here? You are, the count value is updated, is kind of incremented every time that X, uh, sorry, the X value is reset. Um, now, if you didn't have this isolate call here, then um, then the count entry in this reactive value would take 
an explicit reactive dependency upon itself and you'd end up in a kind of infinite loop where um, you've so you evaluate this then you realize that you've invalidated this so this has to be re-evaluated which invalidates this and onwards and onwards and onwards um, by putting that inside isolate you can evaluate this variable without updating the reactive dependencies in the graph um, da, da, da. so yeah so i followed the code within shiny to work out how that actually works and um, so event reactive calls something called bind event which calls something which basically calls uh, code that looks like this um where it sets a reactive um it, it it creates a reactive expression where the dependent values are kind of you know the the kind of explicit dependency on those values is is put in place and everything else is run inside an isolate um call um Sorry, the formatting's a bit messed, messed up. Um, and it, it says that in the book uh, explicitly. I was just trying to chase it through the source code. Um, so uh, in the book, it says that event reactive of X and Y is basically equivalent to a reactive expression on, sorry, there should be curly braces in here, X and with Y isolated um, and similarly observe event of x and y is equivalent to this um, statement so evaluating that has no effect on the reactive dependencies in the graph but evaluating that does update the reactive dependencies for, for whatever this observer node um, does um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's quite neat. Did I, was there another, was there an exercise in this section? I don't think there was. Um, so the final section is on timed invalidation. And this is, there's another example of, of, of this earlier on in the book where they use something called reactive timer, um, which is used to every 500 milliseconds, this, node in the graph becomes invalidated and then anything that depends upon it has to be recomputed so x1 here depends upon timer so every 500 milliseconds this sampling step has to be re-ran um, and this section of the uh, book which I'm not going to go into because there's only really five minutes left of the uh, thing, um, depends upon another kind of internal shiny function called invalidate later, which gives the programmer the power to you know, set a, a time at which the a node should be invalidated within the reactive graph. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could, the, 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 the main power is to to use this in an on exit call so that um sorry some some functions will take longer on a you know in a, a given day than others um so imagine this poisson sampling thing was a less predictable function suppose it you know called to some web api or something like that now on on most days it might take you know tens hundreds of milliseconds on other days it might take seconds to return um and it's difficult to hard code how fast uh um how fast that should update um 
Does that make sense? I don't, I don't know whether that makes sense. Um, anyway, there's lots of interesting internal stuff. So there's, um, if we go back to learning objectives. Um, yeah, so this chapter was mainly about explaining how these different building blocks of shiny apps are uh, a, a little bit more about the internals of them and also how things like event responsive um, reactives and observers um, can be constructed from these lower level functions that you probably wouldn't want to call um, when you're actually building apps, but it's quite a neat, um, they're, they're quite a neat little set of tools upon which the, 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 the more user-friendly things are built. Um, yeah, I don't know, has anyone got any questions? Um, uh, hello. Hiya. I'm are, hi. Um, there are any are there any uh, apps to to see this uh, uh, applied uh, and to see how it works um, 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 on an app? Sorry. So. Um, in uh, in terms of uh, w uh, which s section of the, because uh, um, a lot of the things aren't really connected to each other. So, um, so um, is um, I, I I mean um, it's uh, they are all bits that you uh, need to put inside an app. So uh, I'm just w wondering, was wondering if there's a, any already, like a sample app to to look at. Just so let's have a see. Um, so the examples in the there's an exercise. Um, no, uh, let's, let's see, I'm not, I don't know, this chapter didn't really lend itself to, um, uh, uh, building a, a, an illustrative app, because a lot of it was about the kind of internals of how Shiny works. Um, and, um, so, so, hold on, I'll see if I can, no, um, yeah, I, uh, Or I maybe think... next week we can uh, set up something to uh, conclude this active. <coughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, part um, to 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 show up how it works uh, inside an app because that would be much clearer. Um, I, uh... Because to see in practice, uh, it's it's um, to visualize uh, uh, effectively how it works. Because otherwise, okay. obviously, are, are important uh, be, um, bits that you can use to stop, for example, um, because a change of um, um, database when you make a query. Uh -huh. So. Uh, and then you use some um, uh, 
function, some special function when you request that you have set up your query in the in the database and you then extrapolate the graph, which is uh, the, this this uh, feature, so let's say uh, function inside that um, let's say stop some uh, things at certain levels and show you just some something else instead of everything uh, around and then you can set up um, uh, like what you want to see basically but visualizing an app i think it would be the best way to understand it <laughs> okay. okay um yeah i i don't know i mean there, there are exercises i've got solutions to all the exercises in the thing but um but yeah there wasn't much by way of like um i i, I don't know i couldn't think of of an app to write that kind of illustrated the 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 concepts so much. Uh, one thing that I was keen to work out how to do was to um, uh, illustrate how the observers and the reactives are um, one's eager and one's lazy, and whether I could build an app that would illustrate that and um so one one thing that kind of came out of that was that the I, I i couldn't work i couldn't think of a good example to be honest but um um so a reactive suppose you've got some reactive that like um builds a plot that is shown on one page of your app um, but you're on another page of your app then that um, pl that plot won't necessarily be shown because the the reactive will also it it will have some idea of um, it's inappropriate to do this right now because we're on the wrong page whereas an observer, I don't, but I couldn't work out how to make an observer that would eagerly evaluate in a in a way that I could actually log what was happening. Um, I'll have a think about it, but I, I, I genuinely couldn't work out how to kind of illustrate that. Um, anyway, right, cool. Um, Sorry if I've confused everyone. <laughs> no, it, it is just that next week that there is a like a sort of uh, uh, covering of um, trouble uh, that due to reactive graphs uh, application of this uh, um, functions. So. It would be just to um, <laughs> understand uh, what, how how to solve these problems uh, in case uh, um, loops uh, are created and um, mm. uh, you, you starting calling always the same the same bit and uh, it uh, and the app. Mm, one stop yeah, and instead you do uh, a specified call and and there are other few features too uh, uh, cover as i said um, and troubleshooting basically this reactive graph feature all right oh, what was that okay cool right i'm gonna stop sharing my screen anyway um thanks everyone for coming along uh today um uh okay cool right uh thanks everyone for coming along uh, yeah uh, next week federica is going to be talking about that um final chapter of this reactive graph 